This is the Dean Show. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Dean Show. And today in the studio, back with us again, Dr. Lawrence Brown. You can go to thedeanshow.com to read about him. He has his own private section there. He's a former atheist who was trying very hard to be a Christian, who accepted Islam. And by now you know Islam simply means to acquire that peace that we're all looking for from the owner of peace, the one God. Submitting yourself entirely to him. That's what Islam means. And he has accepted Islam and he also has a DD, Doctor in Divinity, PhD in Religious Studies. And he's here to talk about another topic out of the several that we've covered. We've covered and proven that Jesus, peace be upon him, who is dear and beloved to our hearts, was not God, never claimed to be God, wasn't the Son of God. None of these things. And you can go back to his section and watch some of these previous shows. But in today's show, we're going to be talking about the topic of Jesus now being the Lamb of God. What does that actually mean? Was he led to the slaughter? Did God go ahead and sacrifice him for the sins of the world? Is this fact or fiction? We're going to clear the confusion on this week's show with Dr. Lawrence Brown. Sit tight. Don't go nowhere. This is the Dean. The Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean. This is the Dean Show. 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 This is the Dean Hey, what's up, buddy? Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I had you Lovely going happy. there for a minute, huh? For a minute. We give yeah. those greetings of peace because we want peace, don't we? Do we just want peace? Or we just keep saying peace? I haven't heard people mention the word peace so much as the Muslims do. Every time we greet each other, we're like, peace be unto you. When we see each other, when we're leaving each other, peace be unto you. When we, it's, it's peace, peace, peace. But there's always war and people attributing terrorism to Islam, and they, you know, they seem like opposites. Would you comment on this before we start into our topic? Actually, well, it's interesting that you should mention that, because while you were talking right now, I was thinking about when I got married. Yeah. Because when I got married, I was talking with uh, another brother about just the process of getting married and, you know, having love in the marriage and so on. And he... It was just interesting to me. He just kind of sat back and thought for a minute and said, you know, I think I would rather have peace in the marriage than to have love in the marriage. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. At first I was just thinking, what are you talking about? But then when I thought about it, I realized, you know, you can have, you can have love in your marriage, but it can be a pretty stormy relationship. Yeah, you know, uh, and if you don't have peace in the household, if you don't have peace with your wife, it's going to destroy the marriage. It's yeah. going to destroy the love. But if you have peace, if you have peace with you and your wife or, you know, for the ladies between the wife and the husband, the love grows on top of that and you end up with both. And uh, it's the same way with a lot of things, you know. In Western society, everything we look at is reminding us of happiness. You know, you look at a, a billboard, everybody on the billboard looks like they're having the time of their lives. They might just be advertising a bottle of water, but it, they, they're making it look like, you know, I mean, they're just ecstatic about this bottle of water. You yeah. Know? <laughs> and it's the same way with every advertisement, newspapers, radios, television. Everything is projecting happiness, as if our goal in life is just to be perpetually happy. But that's not very realistic. And the more you fight for that goal, the more elusive it is. You know, we are, we are trying to be just perpetually happy, and you can never achieve that. But what you can achieve is you can achieve being at peace with yourself, 
with those around you and at peace with your creator. Now that's something you can achieve and once you've achieved that, the happiness will come with it. We got to get our priorities straight because the foundation has to be strong before you can build on it. This is some, yeah. good, some good advice, definitely, definitely. And so we're breaking the ice a little bit and we're getting it now to our main topic. Now people, again, can go to your own private section at thedeanistrial.com to see the previous topic, your conversion story, why you accepted the way of life of all the prophets of God, including Jesus, peace be upon him. Islam. Now, at that area, you, we also have the topics of you proving beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus, peace be upon him, was not the only begotten Son of God, that he didn't have a divine status, that he wasn't God, he wasn't the Son of God. You prove this in the top t 10, the top 5, the top 10 reasons, and these were some very exciting shows, and I really encourage everyone to go watch those. But in this week's show, we're going to be talking about the Lamb of God. Let's start. What does this mean, the Lamb of God, that Jesus was the Lamb? Well, first of all, I'm probably not the best person to ask that question. Ask Christians what do they mean, Lamb of God, and see what they say. Yeah. Because like many terms in, in Christianity, most people just have trouble with it. Yeah. What does Lamb of God mean? What is the Holy Spirit? you know, what, what is the comforter, what, et cetera, et cetera. Define, define the Holy Spirit for me. You know, define that. Most people have trouble with these concepts. So what we're dealing with now is we are talking about, in this episode and previous episodes, the tenets of faith that, upon which the Christians and the Muslims differ. So we've talked about Jesus Christ being the only the begotten and the Son of God, the fact that none of these three uh, doctrines is tenable. You know, he's not the only, he's not the begotten, and he's not the Son of God. We've talked about the Trinity. And we have talked about the alleged divinity of Jesus Christ. In my book, Misguided, you'll see that I address 16 points. Okay, so we're just touching on basically half of those. When we come to the concept of the Lamb of God, where this comes from is this comes from John 1.29, where allegedly it is said, you know, um, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this is John the Baptist identifying Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, the problem with this is that the word that is translated to Lamb, Talia, actually the correct translation from the Aramaic Talia is servant, not lamb. So the correct translation would be, behold the servant of God. Now, there's a huge difference between servant of God and lamb of God. Uh, but to try to make it fit within previous scriptural harmonies, um, the translation was adapted to lamb of God, to make it consistent with other scripture. This is not this is not honest, this is not forthcoming, this is not, this is not what we should be doing with Revelation. We should, be, we should be, you know, clear, obvious, and faithful to the Scripture. And were we to do that, the correct translation is, Behold the Servant of God. Now, one point I would make about this is that it's said that in John 1.29, John the Baptist knows who Jesus Christ was. He says, Behold the Lamb of God. This guy's the Lamb of God right here. Hey everybody, Lamb of God right here, we got him right here. Why then in Matthew 11.3 does John the Baptist say, uh, are you the coming one or do we wait for another? Okay, now you can't have it both ways. Either John the Baptist knew who he was or didn't know who he was. Okay, the Christian claim is he knew he, who he was, he identified him as, as the Lamb of God and he said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and we're pointing out Okay, if you're going to say that, then why is it that in Matthew 11:3, you know, he says to Jesus Christ, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? In other words, he doesn't really know who he is. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so you have two big problems here. One is the mistranslation, and the other is that it's clear that whatever John the Baptist is saying about him, he doesn't, he's not certain. He's not certain if Jesus Christ is the foretold one 
uh, to begin with. Hold your place right there. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Sit tight. Whatever Allah commands you to do, you need to do it. Islam has tolerance and mercy and compassion. To know that Allah, you know, will forgive you as long as you do what you need to do, as long as you turn back to Him. Islam is a system of mercy and compassion. And it is for the best benefit of all of the people that surround it, Muslim and non-Muslim. Back here on the Dean Show with Dr. Lawrence Brown. Please continue on talking about the Lamb of God. Short continuation. The only other thing that I would add is that we find the concept of Jesus being the Lamb of God only in the Gospel of John. So if you're going to weigh the Gospels, you have to say the John, Gospel of John is the only one that gives anything that can be kind of manipulated to have this concept. Matthew, Mark, Luke, don't even mention it. So, in essence, you kind of have three votes against one. And even the one vote, the passage I already discussed in John, is extremely weak because of the mistranslation. Now, we know as Muslims, ones who follow that way of total and complete submission to the one God, the same God that Jesus prayed to, that Abraham prayed to, the one God who created the universe and everything in it, he created us in original goodness with a fresh, clean page from the start. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we don't believe that we're stained, that we have a stigma attached to us when we're born, but some people believe in this, this original sin, and this somehow ties into the lamb thing. What do you got to say about this? Actually, the original sin ties not only into the, you know, lambness, but it ties into all of Christianity because if there is no original sin, then what is the purpose of atonement? What, what's the need for atonement? What's the need for the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ if there is no original sin? So this is a very, very critical doctrine. Mm -hmm. Is there original sin? Is there not original sin? Now, in Ezekiel 18.20, we are told the son shall not bear the sins of the father. The wickedness, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Okay? It clearly states in Ezekiel 18.20 that sins are not inherited. Okay? And yet, people say, okay, well, that's Ezekiel. That's Old Testament. We're Christian. We follow the New Testament. Ezekiel, that's Old Testament. Okay, it's Old Testament. No argument there. But you know what? It's not older than Adam. It's not older than Adam. Mm -hmm. The concept of original sin is that it dates from who? It dates from Adam. The, sins, the sin of Adam was inherited to all of mankind. If original sin were a valid concept, none of the prophets throughout time would have talked about it anywhere, any way, any time. And yet you find Ezekiel saying, the son shall not bear the sins of the, of the father. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. In modern slang, in modern English, look, how would you translate this? You know, for the people that, you know, kind of this old English, how would you translate this? Uh, I mean, the translation is clear. You cannot inherit sin. sin you cannot, so... Sin is not inherited. I mean, you would look at a child... And you'd look at the child and you'd say, that child is sinless. Who has ever looked at a baby, picked up a newborn baby and said, oh, wow, they just look so evil. No. You know, I mean, never. It never happens. Who looks at a child, who looks at a ch child, and they just, come on, come on, come here. Sort of like, sort of like Jesus Christ. Yeah. When he said, in Matthew 19, 14, he said, let the children come unto me and do not forbid them. Why? Why? In his words, according to the Bible, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Speaking of the children. Yeah. Now, if we have original sin upon us, if we have original sin upon us, if children have original sin upon them, how is he saying, let the little children come unto me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. So, so if they have original yeah. sin on them, you know, for of such would not be the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of like an attorney, you know, saying, you know, that, uh, my, my client is, is as guilty as a newborn child. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. you know, you, you're responsible for yourself, basically. I'm responsible for mine. What my great-great-grandfather did if he did a crime, you can't come lock me up for it. That's simple. I mean, this is common, common sense. sense. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. So now, so anything else you want to add on the? Not only is com is it common sense, but the point I'm making is not only is it common sense, but it's contrary to scripture. Okay. All right. So anything else on the atonement that you want to original sin that you want to? All of these things we can expand upon more, but you know, for the purposes of our discussion yeah. discussion today, let's move on. Okay. Now we have also that's tied into it atonement. You hear this word also mentioned. Right. I mean, as we said, if there's no original sin, there's no need for atonement, and all of the doctrines that surround this are under question, uh, the doctrine of the crucifixion and so on. We, as Muslims, believe that, that Jesus Christ was not crucified, but it, so it was made to appear to the people, okay, but that actually uh, our Creator raised Jesus up. We do believe that he will come back close to the day of judgment. He will vanquish the, uh, the Antichrist and he will usher in an age of justice. But this is another story. Mm -hmm. in, in speaking of atonement directly, the issue of atonement, the concept of atonement comes from 2 Timothy 2, 8. Okay? Yeah. And in this verse, uh, it's, this is taken from the letter of Paul, right? And it's stated, remember, Paul is stating that, remember that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead according to my gospel. What is he saying? He's saying, that, Paul is saying that it was according to his gospel that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Where else do we find it? That's it. Now, point is, I mean, are you going to trust Paul with your salvation, when we know that, you know, Paul is the only one who wrote about the atonement, the doctrine of the atonement come, comes from Paul, and yet Paul contradicted basically everything that Jesus Christ said and did and was. I mean, Jesus Christ taught Old Testament law, Paul negated it. Jesus Christ taught accountability, Paul taught justification of faith. Jesus Christ taught that he was the Son of Man. Paul taught that he was the Son of God. Jesus Christ taught, pray to God. Paul said, pray to Jesus. Jesus Christ taught that he was an ethnic prophet, not sent but to the lost sheep of Israel. Paul said that he was a universal prophet. And on and on and on. Most powerful thing, Jesus Christ taught, God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Three times three times recorded in the Bible. And of course, from Pauline theology, we get the Trinity. What am I pointing out? I'm pointing out that, you know, you've got Paul and Jesus like this. No, you've got Paul and Jesus like this. Paul and James were like this. Paul and Peter, Paul and Barnabas. You not only had conflict between uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ and, and Paul, okay, disparate teachings contradictory to one another, but you actually had the disciples of Jesus, the true disciples, were in, in open conflict with Paul. Open conflict. And yet, and yet, and yet, people look at the epistles of Paul, and they find the things that they want to teach the atonement, and they grab a hold of that. And they say, okay, you know, we'll believe in the atonement. From this guy who everything else he has done has contradicted Jesus, but we like this part, so we're going to hold on to it. This is so very, very, very select, selective uh, thinking. I mean, it's taking what you want, it's taking what you want because you like it, rather than taking the reality. I mean, if you can picture, now if we can go into, I just, I have a, a lot of questions on this. You know, for the layman, you know, he's not really into the Bible, but you get a lot of people who have a problem with this. And, and people who are born into Christian family, you know, they want to do the right thing. Many people are getting you know, uh, fed up with the rat race of life and they want to develop their spiritual side. They know there's a creator. This is something that's innate in all of us. But this whole concept, they're looking for something else because this doesn't fit, you know. So we give analogies. I'm just thinking, you know, you see, you can imagine like, you know, a father is, you know, let's say walking with his son, you know, and then all of a sudden he pushes his, his son in front of a car and the son, you know, said, you know, dad, dad, you know, what, you know, what? save, me, save, save me. me. And then, sorry, son, you know, this is for the criminals that we got to let loose. I'm sacrificing you for all of them. I mean, you know, is this kind of what we can equate to where, you know, uh, you know, where God is, you know, or the judge is letting, letting, the, yeah. letting the, the criminal go or, or letting his son go so the criminals 
can get can get let loose people who have yeah. you know yeah you know I mean there's some people who say you're thinking like a human being yeah you're thinking like a human being you're not thinking like God okay well how else are we supposed to think yeah I mean God gave us our minds to think in this way yeah all right it makes I mean it just makes sense that God gave us the tools to understand what makes sense yeah and so we understand that this doesn't make sense not at all we understand that you know no son you know father would sacrifice his son for the forgiveness of other people for whom his son has no relation yeah okay how does this relate to that we all understand that but you know I think what is going on is that the concept of the atonement is just such an attractive concept do whatever the heck you want okay do anything you want to in this life go ahead and just have a blast forget the laws forget revelation forget accountability to God forget uh, prayer forget the tenets of faith. do whatever you want but just say I believe before you die and you'll be forgiven convenient now yeah now I mean this is uh, this is just this is taking a religion because you like it not because it makes sense, not because it's believable, not because it's true. Seems really easy and convenient. And let's take a break and we'll be right back with more here on The Dean Show. I come from a science major. When you look at the Bible and it says the, the earth has four corners, the, the, it's, that's wrong. If any Christian can point out a single unequivocal statement, a single unambiguous statement, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, says that I am God, or where he says, worship me, I'm ready to accept Christianity. Back here on the Dean Show with Dr. Lawrence Brown, DD Doctor in Divinity, PhD in Religious Study. Went from being an atheist, trying hard to be a Christian. Now you're a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim. Abraham was a Muslim. We're not the Antichrist. Are you the Antichrist? Someone might say, "Hey, man, this guy's the Antichrist here. Get away. Turn the TV off." I'm for Christ. I I am for everything that Christ stood for and taught. Real but but the point I'm making is that. What Jesus Christ did and said and was are very different from how the church portrays him. We've got a lot of points here. We're almost out of time. Fact or fiction, tell me. This is, we're, we're not making up things. People can go verify this, but we ask that people have an open heart, open mind. Tell me, did Jesus, peace be upon him, or his companions, those that knew him the best, did they ever, did Jesus ever say, listen, and he had pl plenty of opportunities to say, listen, God sent me as his son, to die for your sins. And if you don't believe this, you're going to the hellfire. You know, this is serious business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he ever say that? No, this is an interesting point. Of course, no, he didn't. And, and this, is, uh, you know, this is, I think, a very powerful point because everything in the Bible suggests that Isa, alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, knew of his coming trial, knew of the, you know, the difficulty he would go through, the trial, the persecution, and the, uh, you know, the impending uh, execution or attempt at ex executing him, okay? So, you know, we find Jesus Christ tormented by what he foresees coming, okay? Now, you just have to assume that if he knew that he was going to be paying for the sins of mankind in a couple of days, he was going to be crucified, he was going to be resurrected, and his atonement would, would, would wipe clean the slates of mankind, that he would have been telling this to his disciples. He would have been saying to them, look, guys, don't worry. I'll be back in a couple of days, and, you know, you can just relax. Everything's going to be taken care of. Uh, nowhere does he say that. Nowhere. Instead, instead, he continues, he continues to, to bid his followers to piety, to righteousness, and to the duties of the faith, such as prayer. You know, nowhere did he say, guys, you can relax, you can slack off a little bit, a couple of days, everything's going to be cool. I'm going to, I'm going to take the burden from your shoulders. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and his last dying words, just, just really quickly, uh, was, did it seem like, not, I mean, what they say, his dying words, you know, when he was on the cross, what did he say? What does that mean? Translate to? Yeah, but what were his last words? Because one gospel says his last words were, it is finished, and another gospel says his last words were, into your hands I commend my spirit. Yeah. So, um, again, you can't have it both ways. Yeah. 
One says, his last words were, and the other says, his last words were, mm -hmm. and then they give different stories. Okay, so how, re how reliable is this? Uh, this is one of many, 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 many contradictions in the Bible. Okay, so how do we now, okay... We now, now, the passage you quoted, okay, yeah. I mean, the translation of that is, you know, is, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Doesn't seem like okay, someone that, who's ready to go. That, that actually is blasphemous. Yeah. Okay, and we as Muslims say, we, we don't believe that he said that. Yeah. You know, because that is blasphemous to say, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Job didn't say that. Abraham didn't say that. Yeah, okay, you know, and you, you have all of these prophets. I, I use Job. I mean, Abraham's an excellent example, but I use Job because he's the, you know, he's what we always hold up as the example of patience. He never said, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? And yet we are going to say that Jesus, Jesus Christ's faith was so weak that he, that he believed his Lord had forsaken him. This is blasphemy. Yeah. No... You know, no right. You wouldn't expect that from any righteous person, much less from a prophet, yeah. much less from you know one of the greatest prophets of mankind. Or Abraham, you got calling me to sacrifice my son, showing weakness. No, they were already willing and able. It, obviously, he wasn't ready, and willing, and able so allegedly for what they're saying. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't add up. And you've disproved these things once again. You know, we love our brothers in humanity, and we're just trying to relay the truth, have people open their hearts and minds, and the truth shall set you free. It's very simple. This is not anything hard to comprehend. Where do they go from here now? You might have, you know, really captured a lot of people's attention, but they hold on, hold on. We just got a minute left. How, how do they make sense of it all? What, what do you, you, how do you replace it? <laughs> okay, you want me to say that in a minute. Yeah. Bottom line is this. You look at the Bible. Now, we have spent a bunch of sessions showing, by, showing why what you find in the Bible is not always the Word of God. It's a terrible thing to tear down a person's faith and not replace it. So let me just remind people of what they should believe in. We do believe as Muslims that the Word of God is in the Bible. We don't believe that all of the Bible is the Word of God, but we do believe that within the Bible you do find elements which do represent the Word of God. Among those are the repetitive teaching over and over again from the first commandment on to the teachings of Jesus that know your God is one God. God is one. That that's a common thread throughout the teachings of all of the prophets. Another common thread is that uh, you have the chain of revelation. Uh, our Creator sent down prophets to bear revelation to the people as guidance to them. Every time that revelation became corrupted, God did what? He sent another prophet. This is why prophethood didn't stop with one man. This is why we didn't just have Abraham and that's it. We didn't have just Moses record the Old Testament and that's it. No, the Old Testament became corrupted and that is provable. Okay, and once that happened, what was necessary for Jesus Christ to be sent? To what? To the lost sheep of Israel. Lost why? Because they lost their, the purity of their revelation. Okay, so believe in God as one God, believe in the chain of revelation, believe in, in the prophets who bore the, the message of our Creator to mankind. Included in that package is the Old Testament, Old Testament prediction of three prophets to follow. John the Baptist, Jesus Christ are one and two, and that leaves one final prophet. We find in the New Testament, as we discussed previously in the passage relating to Allos Parakletos, Jesus Christ referencing another paraclete, another of whatever Jesus Christ was, because he was described as a paraclete, and that would be the third and final prophet. The job of everybody out there now is to consider in the light of what we have discussed who might be that final prophet, who might, what might be the revelation that he bore. We as Muslims accept that final prophet as Muhammad, peace be upon him, the final revelation as the Holy Quran. That is the subject of another of my books, and hopefully some more of these sessions. Uh, in the last few seconds, thank you very much. May God Almighty reward you. How, people, how can people get a hold of you to read some of your articles and books? Find my articles, find my books, find me on leveltruth.com or eighthscroll.com. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, thank you. May God Almighty Allah reward you. Thank you. And if you'd like to say hello to Dr. Brown, if you'd like to pay him a visit, leveltruth.com, eighthscroll.com. Take it up with him. If there's some things you feel he missed, no problem. You can reach him there. And now, that was it. It's very simple. It's logical. Yes, many people can claim to be prophets, 
Many people can claim to be on the truth, but look at the teachings. See if the evidence they present is testable, and Islam has the testable evidence, the verbatim word of God, the Quran, and it's a living miracle to this day. Just have an open heart and open mind. Everything that it calls you to is good. It teaches original goodness. It doesn't teach original sin. It teaches pure monotheism, establishing a direct dialogue with the Creator, the one who created everything in this universe, and it teaches you to develop yourself to be the best human being in the world, to be just, to be on justice, great morals, great character. It doesn't teach terrorism, killing innocent men, women, and children. No, it does not. It has nothing to do with this. And if you like what we have to say here today, call the number on the screen, 1-800-662-ISLAM, to learn more. Until next time, peace be unto you.